Now is the time for the affirmative conclusion. Mr. Albrecht, you have 10 minutes. You may begin when you're ready. All right. All right. I want to thank Matt and Turton fan. And although we have many differences, debates like this are very important. I argue that Reformed Protestantism has moved away farther from ancient Christianity. And I think in this debate it has become even clearer. A number of comments a Turton fan has made I'd like to deal with. For instance, he mentions Le Goff, the author of the book, The Birth of Purgatory. And an interesting thing is that Le Goff was not a Catholic. As Turton fan says, he was an agnostic. And Turton fan points out that the word purgatory does not appear until, I believe he says, the Middle Ages. Well, regardless of what Le Goff says, it really doesn't matter to us if the word appears at a later time, because the words for purification and the belief in a purgatorial afterlife, a post-mortem purification, were present in the early church. So Turton fan, in his closing, said that purgatory is not mentioned until the end of the 12th century. <laughs> I was stunned that he actually said that. Because if we examine briefly, covering what the ancient Christians say and the fathers, they speak loudly on this. They speak loudly on this. The Christian sibling oracles, book two, the lines of interest tell us, the poet says, <clears throat> and, the, and the poet tells us in, in this book, that he saw all souls, souls of men burning the pitch and fire. But then the poet tells us that in an instant all shall fuse together and be separated into purity. We then read how, and then shall all pass through the burning river and the unquenchable flame, and the righteous shall be saved, but the impious shall perish. The author is clear in telling us that individual souls of men will be purified. Oxford writer Moriah dates this from the second century. And the Catholic Encyclopedia tells us that books one and two are reg regarded as a Christian revision of a Jewish original. This sounds a lot like the poet, writer, had an idea of a sort of purgation in the afterlife for certain individuals. Certainly the doctrine of purgatory isn't wound up in this book in a clear fashion, but this is proof that an early Christian writer believed in the need of a cleansing for certain souls in the world to come. The patristics are even clearer. Clement of Alexandria tells us that in the afterlife, one passes to the greatest torment, if still having sin, and that punishment cease in the course of the purification of each one. This is a father writing, a father from the 2nd century, early 3rd century, late well, 2nd century, early 3rd century. Origen tells us that if a man departs his light, life with lighter faults, he's condemned to fire, where he must undergo purification. A cleansing fire, Origen tells us. He calls it a baptism of fire. Tertullian tells us, he refers to purgatory as Hades, as a prison that an individual must be put in until he par pays the very last penny. Tertullian's usage of Hades is in reference to the abode of the dead, not the eternal hell. The fathers knew what they were talking about. None of them referenced, uh, uh, when they mentioned hell, <laughs> were referencing eternal hell. When they differentiated, that was. Cyprian says that some individuals were cast into prison and they suffer there to be cleansed and long purged by fire. He says, a third century father. Cyril of Jerusalem, <clears throat> he asks for prayers. He says they're a very, very great benefit to the souls. The golden mouth, Chrysostom, he tells us that Job's sons were purified by sacrifice. So why can't those that have died be purified by our prayers and the sacrifice we offer from the altar? Ambrose of Milan prays for Theodosius that he receive rest. Augustine says that temporal punishments are received by some in the afterlife. That they're punished. They suffer. St. Clement says in the afterlife there will be two fires. He speaks of two fires, a devouring and a consuming one. One destroys those that are sinful, that have sinned mortally, and the other sanctifies and purifies the soul that passes through it. Basil says that if you sin throughout your life, that you're going to be detained. If you haven't, you'll pass to Christ. Basil's Adelphos, his brother, 
Gregory tells us that the, the departed soul cannot partake of divinity until he has been purged, purged of the filthy contagion in his soul by purifying fire. <laughs> so much for the 12th century, speaking about a, a purgatory for the first time, right? The fathers were unanimous on this. All of the fathers taught this, this belief. The fathers have brought it up at least. The Roman Catholic picture of purgatory is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The fire is purgatorial, but it is purgatorial for the man in verse 15 because he is punished, he suffers loss, and then he is saved. Yet so as through fire. The man in verse 14 does not suffer loss. He doesn't get saved only as through fire, nor does he suffer loss. The two passages are very distinct. Church and fan failed to detect that. Verse 14, the man is saved. Verse 15, he's saved also, but only as through fire. The man in verse 15 is punished. He undergoes purification, the Greek word paros. He saved dia paros. The man in verse 17 is outright destroyed. The fathers were clear, and the church has always taught that everyone will undergo a judgment. I'm not adding a novel interpretation to this. I know some people would like to erase verse 14 and say that the fire, you know, the person in verse 14 does not go through the fire. Well, in verse 14, the man does undergo judgment, but he receives his reward, as we see. He doesn't suffer loss. And he's saved only. And he isn't saved only as to fire. He isn't punished. How is this not Catholic teaching? It's clear. It's a clear reading of the scriptures. And it's a clear reading of the patristic sources. The very reason we can undergo suffering is because of that wonderful sacrifice that Christ did for us in the cross. The scripture's clear. I'm not adding anything to it. I'm reading it. It's all I'm really doing. I'm reading it for you. <clears throat> the Reformed theology does not fit into 1 Corinthians 3. Because their theology is flawed. Read it. Verse 14. The man does get punished. I mean, excuse me, excuse me. The man does not get punished. He does not suffer loss. Verse 15. The man suffers loss. The Greek, the Greek word zemiao is present here. And he is saved only through fire. He's undergone purification. Verse 17. The man is destroyed. Read the passage for yourself. The works aren't the only thing that goes through the fire. The fathers in the scriptures were clear. Are works extracted from your body on Judgment Day? That's illogical. All of the fathers spoke on this. That spoke in this belief in purgatory. When I asked Turretin Fan to show me just one father that spoke out against that notion of a post-mortem purification, he showed me Pope Gregory, a father in dialogue, where he was advocating, advocating purgatory. There are no extant patristic sources that speak out against this. Church and fan could not point to a single source that was against this. The earliest interpretation of 1 Corinthians 3, it is exactly how the church has always believed in purgatory. In 2 Maccabees 12, is a wonderful example, and the cross-examination showed this. 2 Maccabees chapter 12 shows us that the author believed that they died in godliness. That's why he prayed for them. He didn't die in mortal sin, or else he wouldn't have bothered praying. If you believe that there was no chance for them to be resurrected. The Greek word usabias highlights the whole passage. The author, whereas he never mentions the word purification, he is concerned that these individuals need prayer and supplications in order that they are able to partake of the resurrection. Perhaps he believed that they would not resurrect. That in and of itself is a punishment. And because of this, because he died in godliness, he prayed for them. This has been an ancient Christian teaching from the beginning. And it is only possible because these individuals are undergoing the sanctification, the last age of sanctification that 1 Corinthians 3 speaks of, the end times. It is the last age and it is only possible because Christ died for our sins on the cross. God bless church and fan and God bless Matt for being so great in this debate. God bless everybody that listens to this debate. Thank you.